more car load coming. Well, that I know of. Maybe it'll be called up. Ask where he is. I want to uh, take this opportunity to welcome you on behalf of the National Park Service. Uh, we are proud to have the only reconstructed Nike Milsa site. And uh, it's quite the adventure. And I think for what you folks do, this is going to be quite the adventure for you. <laughs> because we'll blow shit up. <laughs> 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 Give him his level one pin. We are very fortunate, and uh, because Alan, when he called me, gave me enough time to uh, make arrangements to have two gentlemen who actually work. Awesome. The gentleman behind me, David, is a missileer. Clinton, who you'll meet later, was a nuclear technician. So we're really going to blow shit up. <laughs> <laughs> we got it all. Can you give us a 15 count? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Run. You know, the one thing, you remember that, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. See, duck and cover when I was a kid, and then I looked at it, that the two-inch desk was really going to protect me. <laughs> the one thing you didn't say, in order to qualify to work here, you had to be smart. <laughs> you had to know how to count from 15 to zero backwards. <laughs> that, if you did that, you were qualified. Well, that's all you had to do. Maybe that's why we never fired a missile. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I want to turn you over to David and David will introduce himself. Okay. And it's really an honor to have you guys here. Thank, Thank you so much for coming out. You're the guys that go out to Fernley? Yeah, Lots well, beyond. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're bigger than Fernley. Huh? He's he's dying for this. I More mean, than this is it. Who's from Fiacall here? <laughs> no, I just came back from there. Yeah. Yeah, because people ask us that frequently. Well, what do we have now? And we say nothing here. But yeah. Japan still has Nike Hercules. Korea still has Nike Hercules. Turkey really? still has Nike Hercules. Taiwan still has Nike Hercules. In case any of you are interested, they are currently receiving shipments from Fiacall. Everybody knows who Ace or Thyacol is, right? Yeah. Well, they make the real thing, and they get to blow shit up. <laughs> so their, their boosters now are uh, the same configuration that we had here in 1956, but the fuel has changed considerably. The formulation of the fuel, I went out to a demonstration last summer. Uh, mostly I went out to watch the reenactment of the Transcontinental Railroad come together, which is also right there at Longitory Point. And uh, they found out who I was and said, hey, We've got something you'd like to see. And they said, do you like to blow shit up? <laughs> Come on with us. We're going to go do this thing. So I, I, we went out there and we watched them. Uh, it, it was very interesting. And uh, I thought we were pretty special in that we could attain 120,000 feet with the Nike Hercules in 1971 from Fort Bliss, Texas. And I thought that was exceptional. Same rocket, same guidance system, same payload, lighter payload. Okay. Nuclear materials are now manufactured. The tritium and deuterium are now much less complicated. The triggering devices are simpler. They still use a vacuum tube controlled guidance system. And why do they do that? EMP. EMP. It can work in a war environment. Electromagnetic pulse is, uh, is our best defense. It really is. Nobody even knew about it. All right, come on in this way. <laughs> uh, just, just to kind of give you the credentials, and since I do similarly look similar to this, but uh, 40 some odd years older, that's a picture of me when I was the launch officer here at 19. Okay. 19 year olds in nuclear weapons, hey. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, yeah, what could possibly go wrong? We had no wheel vehicles. So, uh, everything had to be pushed around by hand. Um, they, jerked, they came and got me out of uh, Denver University when I was 16 and a half years old in 1964. And they said, we have a proposition for you. Okay, And I said, well. I don't want to be a military lawyer, because I could see they were wearing uniforms and I was sharp. And they said, this is our proposition. We'll give you a pass on Vietnam, and we're going to make you a missileer. And I was curious as to what tests I failed. 
<laughs> <laughs> that made these guys come and talk to me. They took three of us out of the class and took us to Fort Bliss, Texas for an 18 month training program in being a missileer. You pretty much got a current then degree, that, what the military calls current, because you go to school every day, okay, six days a week, and you start off at four in the morning and you get out of class mm -hmm. at four thirty five in the problem. afternoon. And sometimes you have night classes, and the missileer school was eighteen months long. Hmm. So at the end of that time I came out, so that be put put me in here at nineteen years old. And I noticed that that and like we were just explained to these the kids that were just here, who were close to nineteen, that that was the average age of all the missileers on this site as well as all the other Nike systems around here. Now, to give you some relief, currently, I teach the classes here for the weapons intern program out of Sandia and the political science doctorate degree from Stanford. They, they also go through the same kind of thing a little bit longer. It takes a week to go through it. But, uh, so we shrink it down for you guys on the weekenders. All right? <laughs> um, they are now all have, all the missileers have doctorates. Hmm. They're in their 30s. Most of them have families with children. Um, and these are being trained, uh, if you look up, punch some of these into Google, these letters that are on this patch for the weapons intern program. Um, these are rather strange places like the Sandia Labs or either here or in New Mexico. And it would surprise you how many there are. How, how many of you know how currently what our nuclear weapons stockpile is for the United States? 1,800. 1,800. How many? 8,000. 8, well, in southern Nevada, just above the Nellis Air Force Base test range, in the old silver and lead mines, we have 70,000 <coughs> nuclear weapons stored, and that is only the western arsenal. <laughs> okay. We currently have none of the repatriated or the warheads that we've purchased from the Soviet Union, from Kazakhstan, from Georgia. Um, these kids that I'm training, they go through this litany of names of countries that we're buying this stuff from. That all goes into the East Coast. Now, a number of these students were being trained to do these weapons decommissioning. Um, pretty sounds like a pretty impressive job to me. I don't know. I wouldn't do it. I learned my lesson here watching washing missiles down with trichloroethylene. <laughs> uh, which I see is in the news again because that's what's seeping up through the ground into the Kugel building. Oh. But we used to wash the missiles over here, trichloroethylene, we used it straight, and we washed the missiles down just totally. Nobody said you had to wear a mask or gloves or anything like that. Uh, you'll notice that there are no poppies growing. <laughs> okay. That's because in 1968, Commander Carter, who was the senior man here, he was about 35 years old, ex-Marine, um, had a tour in Vietnam. He was the battery commander. I have no idea how he got from Marine Corps to nuclear Nike program that he was here. And he ran this like the Marine Corps days. A very, very strange kind of a place. But he decided that the poppies out here that covered the hills, because we kept this all cut, we didn't we were a little leery of fire. <laughs> the, the most dangerous thing we had above ground was the trichloroethylene and all the paint. We had lots of paint out here. So we sprayed these hills. He had to spray all these hills. There were 175 of us out here. We loaded up our sprayers with and he told us how to mix trichloroethylene, you know, one part trichloroethylene, 20 parts water, and spray the hills with it. Well, I figured, since I was going to be here for a while, that straight trichloroethylene would probably be a lot more effective than this diluted stuff, right? Because I didn't want to have to spray this again next year. And uh, so that's what I did. We sprayed all of this with trichloroethylene. They still, when we get a good heavy rain, they still run down and test the pond down here. And you'll see it in the assembly area, the drain goes, Yep, right into the pond down there. And it gets a sheen to it periodically, it kind of below, you know. We had those, those ducks that never walked that used to breed down there. They could fly all right, they just couldn't go anywhere but Rodeo Lagoon. They couldn't, had some trouble walking. Don't understand it. But, that, so that's kind of a footnote to what they did here. I was here for 1968 and 1969. And uh, then I was sent back to Fort Gordon, Georgia as an instructor. And then I was back out here in 1971 and again in 1974 to close down the base. Interesting thing about this general area, 
1774, a Spanish ship, the Azura, sailed into San Francisco Bay and left two brass cannons over in Fort San Carlos. That's now Fort Point. Two brass cannons. 200 years later, we took apart the Nike site as the last defensive unit for the San Francisco Bay. Now, some of you being rocketeers, you would wonder, well, what kind of a defensive system do we have now? And we have, coincidentally, you. Because other than the arms you have locked in your closet, that is the only defense system. If the San Francisco Bay Area was to come under attack, I have this first-hand, one-month-old knowledge. Our nearest military cover is in Fallon Air Force Base. Okay? They could scramble three fighter cover jets to get here, and they only have one problem when they get here. Yes, yeah. yeah. very good. So they have to pull in, and they can't go to Travis Air Force Base. Travis Air Force Base, the community around there had said, we don't like the noise from the unsound restricted GE engines. So they can only go to Moffett Field. Bizarre. Where they in our car launch. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They, they interrupt your launches? Yeah, we launched that. We launch at Moffett Field. Oh, oh. The last time I was there, I was watching the space shuttle thing, and I thought, didn't everybody know this was coming? And didn't the guy know where everybody was standing? Why did he fly over there? We were all over here, yeah. photographing yeah. the escort airplane. Mm -hmm. Bizarre. The, the military still works the same. You could ask my son. He's one of the Marines that is currently not assigned to Mali. He's there as a stay, scout and target acquisition, using his laser designator to help spot for the global hawk orbiting over his head, which I think accompanies him wherever he goes. Uh, so, in 19, at the end of World War II, we'll get into why you came out here. At the end of World War II, the United States is clamoring, no more Pearl Harbors, no more Pearl Harbors. As we just went over with those students here, at, today, we have the same situation. We're clamoring for that we don't want anything else. What, what is that? And we're investing billions of dollars of treasure so that we can avoid having another 9-11. And we've been chanting this thing now for 10 years. We put restrictions on every citizen of the United States so we never have another 9-11. Right? The end of World War II, the psychology was much higher. Almost everybody had been directly involved or suffered a loss during World War II. Everybody, every citizen of the United States. They were very concerned about fleets of airplanes approaching from the west and attacking all the defense installations here on the west coast of the United States, both around Los Angeles, Seattle, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, most of you have been around here long enough to remember that. How many people are from the Sausalito or Marin County? No rocketeers in Marin County? East Bay. Okay. They blew that yeah. shit up. The rest yeah. of you weren't, didn't, aren't from San Francisco? No? Okay, so South Bay. where were you from? Southern California. Southern? Okay, and you're from the South Bay? Did you grow up here? Off and on. Uh, my, my dad was Navy, so I bounced between San Diego, SoCal, and San Diego, well. good, good. That, that fits with what I'm about to say. How many of you know, before you saw it on California Gold, that there were Nike sites out here? You knew it? Oh, yeah. Is that because you're interested in rocket yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Most of the people I ask go, what? How long have these been here? Oh, like from 1954 until 1971 they were here. So, but, but you all knew about it when you were kids and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I used to go uh, surfing in Pompeii. How, uh, what year? Oh, uh, well, uh, my dad always wanted to go to the beach. So, definitely uh, late 60s. Okay. We do, we do the you drove around the site and took pictures and stuff? No. no. <laughs> Why didn't you take any pictures? Because we had a VW bus. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't let you through the tunnel. <laughs> In the 1960s. It would be suspicious. Um, I mean, this is really an ideal place. I, I complain a lot about being drafted at the age of 16, but um, this is a very interesting place in that here we are, we have our own private beach. Although when he came out, it was semi-private. Um, we had our own private beach. We had all the beer we could drink for free. Up at the, we had our own little PX. Wow. You had 175 guys, not a lot. You could share. Absolutely no girls. 
not a single one, not even the hint of one. You could hardly smuggle one out here. Okay? If you could get a girl that was willing to hike over Hawk Ridge, you might be able to do it. But by the time she got here, she was too exhausted for anything. So I'm telling you, this is like the monk's club out here. We had all of this, although today is a very rare day, you can see your shadow. This is, this is an event. Usually it's very foggy and very cold. And, and there's no problem hearing the fog horn running. So it was very, very isolated, um, very few guys. We were divided into two groups. If you drive up past the barracks, and that's where I used to live, was up on the other side of uh, Battery Wallace here in those green buildings that the YMCA now has. I was in the furthest east building. And then if you come north in the furthest east building, I was the second window from the end. That was my room. That's where the launch officers always occupied that room. There were two of us. One for A battery, one for B. We worked a very strange kind of a schedule, and uh, that was that you would spend a week off. So they would take you on a bus. They couldn't take you to Sausalito. Uh, when Captain Carter was here, everybody had to have what was called high and tight. Anybody in here been in the military? What's high and tight? Nastiest haircut ever created. Nice yes. skin on the side, and you got maybe a golf divot on the top. Yes, that's Ooh. it. Uh, and in Sausalito in the 1960s, would you have blended in with that haircut? <laughs> <laughs> Today you would have looked okay. In 1968, yeah. not a chance. Yeah. So Sausalito was off limits to missileers. All missileers, including their families, which kept us mostly out of Marin County. Um, just couldn't go there. So they would bust us into San Francisco. They drop us off on Haight Asbury. Oh, <laughs> a busload of guys. With these haircuts, we blended. We kind of blended in with the Navy guys, but not a lot. Um, and there, there we were. And the bus came back every day. And the reason it came back every day, in the evening, was because they knew that by about the second or third day you were broke, and you were coming back out here to the base. So my whole crew would usually be back within two or three days of having our week off. Now, on your week off, if you were out here, okay, then you were on the duty roster because the only way you got to eat was to be on the duty roster. This is another one of Captain Carter's ideas. <laughs> so, uh, and there's always plenty to do. I can advise you now that should you ever choose to restore something, like we did this missile site, don't do it at the beach. <laughs> this is the same problem that we had when I was here. The officers painted and scraped, as well as the enlisted people. And believe me, there were, there were long, boring days before I decided to chip in and start painting with the rest of the group. I thought, you know, I kind of had that British image of an officer, and after all, I was 19 years old, and a W-2, so in case you don't know, a W-2 is an officer that isn't really an officer, warrant but two. So a W-2 is a warrant. A commissioned officer is somebody who's appointed by Congress, okay? Der Dianne Feinstein gets to say, this guy is good to be an officer, that kind of a thing. But they needed me so bad, they just said, you, you're an officer, here, here's your stuff, go, it's time to eat. So, I was W-2, 19 years old, not a bad place. They did let me have my own car. No gas facilities <coughs> out here. I had a 62 Oldsmobile Starfire, about six and a half miles to the gallon. <laughs> um, so, life out here was, was a little austere, all right? Uh, they divided the barracks up. The one, the one barracks that runs east and west, that was for the integrated fire control guys, the radar guys that were up on the hill. And the, Barracks that runs north and south, that was for the launcher people. The two groups could not associate. Restrictions were very high. They had this need to know. Any of you worked where you had to have a Q clearance or any type of security clearance? So they had the, this thing here, equal knowledge, equal rank, and need to know. So those three things, and a two-man rule. No place could you go around here unless there were two of you, and the two of you had to be equal rank with equal knowledge. Now, you might say, well, wait, but if there's only two launch officers, then you both had to be here to do anything, right? Right. They had that one figured out, too. We both had to be here. If, we, if the base wasn't closed and we were on our week off, we both had to be here. So that was it. Then you do a week of maintenance after your week off. You come back, you do painting and scraping. There's always a lot of that. You would build or take apart of the soul. <coughs> Uh, break down a launcher and put it back together. Uh, do all the things that don't work when you re make things out of metal at the beach. And you'd paint everything. And they had a saying out here, and that's if it's painted, it's dangerous. Okay? 
okay? So that, that was kind of fun. Um, we had pretty much, pretty much lived inside the exclusion area. We used the building, not this nice big building here, but the little shed that's the third building in that group. It's this little building. That's the building they let us use the bathroom and, and the ready room. So when you were on hot status, and we'll get into that in just a minute. So you had this maintenance week. Then you would go on standby for a week. When you were on standby, you were 17 minutes alert to launch. So when the siren went off, you had to have your missiles up and ready to fire in 17 minutes. After that week was over, you would go on to being hot batteries. Now, one fourth of the 11 batteries around the San Francisco Bay were hot at any given time. Right, so there's about three to four batteries that are hot 24 seven. The missiles are still kept underground. You don't practice your drills. You don't do any of that kind of stuff. You live in the little wooden building up here at the top of the hill and you're five minutes alert to launch. So all your arming plugs are in. The arming plugs go into the sides of the guidance section like this. Um, we used to have them here if in, the, in the Warhead building. You get to see some arming plugs and stuff in there. So they're kind of interesting. Um, and and that's, that's what your life was like then. If you went on alert, you were in the pit, the missile pit. You'll get to see that today. Um, I don't know if I'll be the one to take you through there, but the longest time I ever spent in the launch box where they, this panel was kept, which is back around the corner inside the magazine, was 43 hours. Seven guys in this, you'll see the room for 43 hours. And we didn't think ahead. Mm. Usually, our alerts would last four or five hours. You know, and if, if you weren't at war in four or five hours, you weren't going to be. That was kind of the theory. So, yeah, it was kind of you interesting. Bring books or anything to do other than just stare at each other? No, no, you didn't bring anything. You didn't bring any bathroom facilities. You didn't bring anything to eat. You didn't. We had the water at the canteen if you had it, but most of us, after we'd been here for four or five months, didn't carry our canteens around. Things like that. I did have my sidearm. She's not really a good way to tell the time now. She's the lowest ranking officer in either one. I don't know what the theory was on that, but there was always one of us that was armed um, outside of the exclusion area. So, um, so that's basically how the day went. Again, we were trying to defend against all these airplanes and stuff that were flying in, attacking from their aircraft carrier and hordes. all right? Well, in 1953, something else happened through 1956. Everybody was, everybody was alive then, you know what it was, right? It was the subject of all your history classes for the next two years. No, not exactly the Korean War. But close, close. Beep. Sputnik. 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 So Sputnik goes up, and the Soviets now have the, Alexander said, you always had to occupy the high, high, high ground. ground, right? So you guys at 106,000 feet, that is the high ground. So they got to occupy, now they've got something up there in space. Once it's in orbit, it can, using gravity and speed, drop that thing down wherever you want it. Just calculations, right? It's just geometry. So formula doesn't change. Speed, weight, distance, right? Height, you know exactly where it's coming down, all right? Exact, the nuclear weapons technology is pretty exact, right? Yes, I know. We, from here, from ADCAP, we had tracked a uh, meteorite that hit in Moab, Utah, and we thought, we're going to go get it. We should have been the size of both sides. Um, but so you, you, you're, you're ready for all of this. They want to change. The satellite goes over. Now, if you're going to fly from San Francisco to, say, London or Berlin or Russia, which way do you go? Go north, because the Earth is smaller at the top than it is in the middle. <laughs> Notice how we conform with nature's way, right? We're smaller at the top than we are in the middle. So, target package is no longer out here. Target package is up here. We realized this in 1956. The bombers, the, the new uh, Tupolovs, the bears and stuff can fly over the poles from Vladivostok. They aren't going to come from over the ocean anymore. 19-year-old missileers, nuclear weapons, targets over Sacramento. What do you think we changed? Nothing. 
That's right. We changed nothing. So when they sent me back, when I turned 20 years old, they had a new, another policy out here that's kind of amazing. When you turn 20, you were no longer qualified to be a launch officer. You were gone. You were back at Fort Gordon, Georgia, teaching the Missileers new ones coming in. Um, interesting concept. I didn't learn until much later. Out here running tours in the 80s, that uh, there was a theory behind that. Anybody in psychology here do any kind of mental work? Just close it up. Okay. Later um, teenage years, remember, I are more, more prone to actually do what they're told without asking too many more questions. Yes, 20 year old males, I've been told by people with doctorates that work for the government, though. Um, <laughs> 20 year old males do not associate cause and consequences. They are more apt to act as they're told or trained to do. Sounds like military thinking to me. So, when you're 20, I was called into Captain Carter's office. He says, Mr. Kreutzwanger, I understand you have a girlfriend. Yes, sir. Didn't figure I was going to hide it from you. We met her twice, so. <laughs> um, yes, sir. She lives in the area. Yes, sir. She lives in Marin County in San Rafael. Mr. Kreutzwanger, here's your orders. Fort Gordon, Georgia. You'll be there in two days. Okay? Now, it was not so much that I had a girlfriend, although I did have an attachment to the community. That was just a secondary. I was 20 years old, getting close to 21, so I was done as a missile air, as a launch officer in the missile program. They sent me back to Fort Gordon, Georgia. I taught there for a year or a year and a half. Uh, they sent me to another school at Fort Bliss to be a weapon, nuclear weapons, uh, weapons specialist and uh, raised my pay grade up a few notches and sent me back out here to build these things. So, I mean, that, that was their progression. And the thinking was, is for the 18 months that you go through the school at Fort Bliss, Texas, every day, they have you repeat before you're allowed to eat or go to the bathroom or do anything else. You fall out, you hit that hot tile floor, and you start screaming at the top of your lungs, you're the last line of defense. Nothing gets past me. I'm the last line of defense. Nothing gets past me. We run this chest all the time at the end of our tours. We're going to do it with this school group that comes through. Um, this group's a little old for that. But um, although we'll try it, when we come back through, we'll do a panel drill. You will have had all the background. You'll know all the history by then. And we, what we're going to want out of you, ladies, is we're going to want you to pick the size warhead you're going to use to defeat the enemy. Keeping in mind that the 19-year-old that was trained to have that job screamed for every day for 18 months, I'm the last line of defense. Nothing gets past me. Now, who? I have any Marines in here? No Marines? Army? Army. What, what school? <laughs> Fort Wachuca, 96 oh. Delta 10. Helicopters? No? Imagery analyst, Intel. Okay. Uh, he's one of those smart guys. <laughs> where's, where's a ground pounder when you need it? Um, so, in, in the Marine Corps, in the Army, the Marines yell, kill, kill, kill. In the army, when you're regular army and stuff, and not not gifted and chosen and things like that. <laughs> but I'm sure they had something, uh, you know, equally bizarre like solve the puzzle, solve the puzzle. They, they had to do this every every day, every day, every day, every day. Um, my own son who went through the Marines. He he did, he did that. You know, he's the same thing. And now you ask him, Evan, what do you do in the Marine Corps? Uh, Dad, I get to blow shit up. <laughs> Why do you want to spend your time running around? Uh, Dad, I get to blow shit up. We you're out in the desert all the time. So I was out in the desert with the Boy Scouts, and they didn't get to blow shit up. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of the mentality and the way it goes. So the Army guys, remember? Because I'm going to pick one of you, too. All right? Because I'm the last line of defense. Nothing gets past me. And I literally told you that every day. Every day. Because if it gets past you, they're going to drop something bigger and badder than Hiroshima and Nagasaki somewhere on your family. Because they already got past the Air Force, and they got past the Navy. Of course, the Navy was a little handicapped because they're coming from over the North Pole. Not a lot of naval forces between here and Russia going north and over to the Soviet Union or China. All right? A little thin for the Navy out there. So it's all Air Force. It's those guys that are on the alert up there at Mount, what's it called? Mount of North Dakota or something like that. It's the news line up in Canada. Anyhow, wherever it is, they're cold. Um, so that was basically it. Now, we'll get into the structure. Any questions about that? Anything about the Cold War? <clears throat> By the way, keep in mind that during these missile deployments and, and this, this period of time that Robert McNamara was the Secretary of Defense, 
And what was his edict? What was his theory of peace, maintaining peace in the world? There you go, mass. Mutual assured destruction. Okay. This is also Eisenhower and Churchill's. They, they thought the bombing raids were mutual assured destruction. Germany bombs London, we'll bomb Berlin. And they thought that the thought of that was too horrid for him to do it. It's kind of like the fiscal cliff and this thing you're doing now. It's too horrid for anybody to contemplate. Yet, we still go there. Why is that? The views now. Because nice. if we build it, <laughs> they will come. So, Night Hercules. They come in these great big metal tubes. You'll see a number of them on here. There are currently 14 missiles on site here. Uh, the site was always assigned a, a, a minimum of uh, 12. Uh, why we need extras, you might ask, and I would say because whenever you have a gun you want reloads, right? You've got to have some reloads around. It takes about four or five days to build the Nike. It was done in this building, and I, we have a picture in the Warhead building that's kind of unique, but it comes in a big tube that you can put on a truck. Uh, this portion is stuck in the front here. Uh, the rocket motor does come separate. Uh, the hydraulics and all that that's displayed down at the end there, those are all like they are now. The fins and stuff are collapsed and stored inside. So it's kind of like a model airplane in a box. 19-year-old guys, model airplane in a box, list of instructions, 272 pages, not a problem. Right? So you start pulling the little pieces out, you get all, you get all 12 of the 19-year-olds in here, and you start building the Nike. And we build the guidance section here, and the missile body, the rocket body. So it's the part that you're most familiar with. This big gap between here and down there is where the rocket motor goes. I'll show you one of those. We have one parked outside. Uh, does anybody in here knows the formula Venturi theory? Anybody? I'd sure like to get that written down. I've looked in all kinds of rocket books and stuff. And the only guys who ever know that is the Sandia guys, and they won't tell me. <laughs> I know they know. Just the theory of how the Venturi and how it increases the force of the propellant moving through the Venturi it's a D. Lavelle Nozzle. The what? It's a D. Lavelle Nozzle theory. It's not the theory. It's oh, okay. D. Lavelle Nozzle uses the Venturi principle, which is an equation for the flow through a nozzle. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the affinity law also come into effect? Where's my Because as, as your flow is remaining constant and you're decreasing your, your area, you're increasing the velocity, which also decreases the pressure. I had a big whiteboard in here. Where'd it go? Oh, here's, here's the whiteboard. Okay. Uh, uh, you can put it back there. I was going to have you do this thing, but we don't have time right Yeah, I know. Oh, that's how. But if you did I'd appreciate it. That's my phone number and my email address. I have a lot of people ask about that that don't know much about rockets and stuff. And I've had the guys from Sandia and Fiacol explain it to me, but I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, now this piece of equipment over here, this is kind of unique. This was not in this building. How many of you know what the Antikytherium is? Found off the coast of Greece, about 4,000 years old? You know what it is? Right behind you. Nobody quite knows what it is. What do you think? Yeah. What do you think? It's a computer. Do you think somebody back reverse engineered the, the, the unit there? Um, so take a look at that as you're moving around. In the back, we have the radar tubes and stuff like that. Take just a couple minutes to work through here, and then we'll head up to the next section because they're blowing the whistle down. <laughs> Any questions? The 956 was targeting the San Francisco Bay Area with their uh, air bomber. Yeah. 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 They were going to send, and I only know this subsequently, I didn't know this then, but I knew their theory. And they were going to send about 200.